Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. It's hard to believe this presentation was made over 10 years ago, but Cliff uncannily predicts most of what's going on today. All the goals of the United Nations have been there all along for those who had ears to hear and the eyes to see. Now we're living in it. The UN Plan to Rule the World by Cliff Kincaid. Enjoy. And let me preface my remarks today by perhaps disappointing some of you. I'm, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a biblical expert. I'm a, uh, brace yourselves, a journalist. Uh, I'm a writer. I'm an analyst. I'm a researcher. And at least when I went through school, especially high school, when I got my first interest in journalism, we learned things like who, what, when, where, why, how. That's supposed to be, you know, just the facts. That's what I've tried to do. Now, I have interpretations of these facts, but I'm going to present them to you so you can draw your own conclusions. What I do, uh, by the way, if it, if it takes another 15 years to be invited back, that means I'm going to be back in 2028. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> I guess I'll be, what, 39 years old then? Uh, no, I've been in Washington, D.C. as a journalist, researcher for accuracy in media, for our own group, America's Survival, for over 30 years. And it was uh, about 20 years ago that I got on to the topic of the UN, wrote these two books, plus a follow-up book on uh, the Army soldier Michael New, who under Bill Clinton had uh, refused to wear the UN uniform and uh, was prosecuted and given a bad conduct discharge. Uh, that uh, case was fought uh, through the courts. Uh, we didn't win that case, but I'm going to talk about some cases tonight that are worth fighting because I don't want you to be discouraged. Uh, I'm on your side. We're in Washington, D.C. fighting these battles, and these are battles worth fighting. Any way we can postpone this ongoing catastrophe, it's worth doing. And we're trying to be in the forefront of that. So I bring into this discussion literally years, decades of experience in journalism in Washington, D.C., but also traveling abroad. I've been to many different UN conferences. Uh, we've investigated these matters at home and abroad, including at the UN in New York City, but at UN conferences around the world. I'm not trying to be immodest, but I come at this effort really with some of the best sources of information. Uh, people who have documented the rise of things like the New Age movement, uh, such as I'm sure you remember and know about Constance Cumby, author of Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. Uh, researchers who have worked with us, we've published their work, uh, such as Lee Penn, author of uh, the important book I recommend to you, False Dawn, who have talked about not only the rise of the New Age movement and who have put it into words documenting what we know to be true, but documenting and cataloging the apostasy in the church. But also, uh, through my group, America's Survival, we've been able to tap into the expertise of defectors from the international communist movement, who have been able to uh, provide proof at our conferences. We hold regular conferences in Washington, D.C into how the communist movement is very much alive here and abroad and is pulling some of the strings behind the forces of global jihad that are threatening the United States and Israel. 
We continue on a regular basis to document what the UN is up to. One of the things we did last uh, year, as a matter of fact, was we got documents out of the State Department through something called the Freedom of Information Act about how the State Department, our State Department, on the occasion of the anniversary of the founding of the UN, had released a report in which they somehow managed to ignore the fact that the first acting Secretary General of the UN, who was really the main founder of the UN was, of course, Soviet spy and U.S. State Department official Alger Hiss. The State Department didn't want to admit that, uh, but, but this is a known fact. And, and during the, the 60 years or more of the UN's existence, it has served as a front for the communists, but more importantly, recently has become has become a front uh, for the Arab and Muslim nations of the world. Roughly 56 members of the UN are Arab or Muslim nations today. A front for Arab Muslim interests operating through a group called the Organization of the Islam for Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, which is now on a worldwide campaign to outlaw any criticism of Islam, or the prophet Muhammad. One of the things my group does, active in Washington, D.C., and around the, the country, is we, in the spirit of Andrew Breitbart, I'm sure you all remember Andrew, we take the battle into the streets, so to speak, in, in confronting these issues directly and achieving a form of, you might call, solidarity with freedom fighters here and abroad. In the United States, in regard to the communists, we will go, for example, uh, to public events where you can find people like Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers, the former members of the communist terrorist Weather Underground group, who were at one time, of course, close associates of the President of the United States, who in fact helped launch his political career in their home in Chicago. So we confront them, and we also join hands with uh, freedom fighters around the globe who stand up for freedom and against these totalitarian forces. Now, before I talk about uh, those in the picture, I want to emphasize that this can be hazardous to one's health. I personally have been singled out by groups like the far left Southern Poverty Law Center and the George Soros funded Center for American Progress as an Islamophobe or as the Southern Poverty Law Center calls me a leader of the radical right. And you, you tend, I tend to sometimes laugh these things off because, you know, you can call me names, it doesn't bother me, except for the fact that on occasion uh, these kinds of epithets can inspire people onto a course of deadly action. And I want to mention uh, something that happened that you probably read or heard about last December when a militant homosexual entered the offices of the Christian conservative group, the Family Research Council, in Washington, D.C., with a gun, and he opened fire. He uh, wounded the security guard. He had a bag of Chick-fil-A sandwiches protesting their CEO's support for traditional marriage, and he was going to go throughout the FRC offices shooting their employees. And uh, uh, according to the court record, he was going to rub the Chick-fil-A sandwiches in the face, faces of all the victims. And he's just been sentenced uh, to prison. He was captured because the security guard uh, 
wrestled him to the ground, was injured, recovered, but saved who knows how many people from getting shot or killed. And I, I emphasize this to tell you that those of us who are in this battle in Washington, D.C. are literally on the front lines because this, this is a battle in which our lives are at stake. But as bad as it can be, as bad as it is in Washington, D.C., what's happening in Europe, you need to know about. We joined with some freedom fighters in New York City at a 9-11 conference last year uh, who have really been on the front lines. Uh, in the left-hand picture, Lars Vilks, a Swedish artist, Lars Hedegaard on the right, uh, from Denmark, both targets of assassination attempts in Europe uh, by jihadists. In the case of Vilks, because he drew a cartoon of Mohammed and he got marked for death, uh, they tried to set his house on fire, the jihadists did. Uh, a, a suicide a bomber was sent after him. On the right, Lars Hedegaard, literally just about two weeks ago, went down in his home in Denmark. He thought that someone dressed in a postal a service uniform was going to deliver a package to him and needed his signature. He went down there. It was a jihadist masquerading as a postal worker, tried to shoot him in the head. Uh, he fought the attacker off and survived. But what's happening in Europe, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is coming to America. And I, I don't like to sugarcoat the conclusions that I've come to after this research, so I want to be blunt about it. Uh, Europe is lost. Europe is lost to Western civilization. Uh, the jihadists are making and have made enormous gains. And you look to the south of our border, so many countries lost to the communists uh, since, uh, well, really the last eight years in a major reversal of the advances in favor of human freedom in Central and Latin America that were made under former President Reagan. What's, what's happening in the Middle East is, is complicated, but we've managed to put the pieces of the puzzle together, and I think you need to know what's really happening behind the scenes. We know on one level, uh, President Obama is supporting the forces of what are called the Muslim Brotherhood. This is the group uh, that has taken power in Egypt and which has really spawned almost every significant radical Arab or Muslim terrorist group over the last 40 years, including groups such as Al-Qaeda and Hamas. What is not usually reported, but what we have documented through our conferences and people speaking to our events in Washington, D.C., is the hand of the Russian communists they don't call themselves communists anymore, but the Russian communists and the old KGB in much of this upheaval. One of our speakers at one of our conferences, Konstantin Prail Brzezinski, a former KGB officer who defected to the United States, he and others have confirmed, for example, that Yasser Arafat, the late chairman of the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, was a KGB agent. In other words, an agent of Moscow. Uh, we have evidence showing that Ayman al-Zawahiri, who is now in control of al-Qaeda and who really always has been, he's been operational director, uh, is also a KGB agent. Uh, he happens to be one of the al-Qaeda leaders that for some strange reason President Obama can't find to destroy with his drone strikes. We just can't seem to find him. And to top it off, the leader of Iran, the Grand Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, 
we've documented was trained in Moscow at what was called Patrice Lumumba University. So he is effectively a Soviet or Russian agent as well. And when you understand these connections, perhaps you can put them together with what we know about Bible prophecy and understand how Russia and Iran and perhaps China could come together in a final conflict. And I repeat, uh, nobody really has the kind of information we've been able to develop over many years in Washington, D.C., using the best available sources uh, here and abroad in order to not predict, we're not predicting, but not even to forecast, but to lay the groundwork of what indeed may be happening in the Middle East and the world. Now, the Russians, who are really Obama's new partners, remember he promised then President Medvedev of the Russian Federation that he would be more flexible in the second term, they are working together uh, to pick up, I believe, will be the pieces after Obama visits Israel in March. Uh, this is one of the logos they've actually come up with on the top right there in Israel to symbolize this visit, which is important to them. Now, they refer to uh, the, quote, unbreakable alliance between Israel and President Obama. How many believe it's an unbreakable alliance? Now, I don't think that alliance is going to hold up. I think that alliance will eventually break down. And I believe what's coming, because of the intense pressure on Israel, will be to develop what Shimon Peres called the New Middle East. And he wrote about this openly. Now, a lot of people, when they talk about the Israeli leadership, they refer to the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And he is certainly a critical player. But I submit it's Perez, who, who is the president of Israel, who's not considered to have the power, but who is really a fixture, a, a longtime figure in the state of Israel, and is probably more important in the overall global scheme of things than even Netanyahu. Because if you read Perez's book and understand his approach, you see him there on his own book, being pictured with Yasser Arafat and then President Clinton. I think what they're angling towards, based on the best that we can determine, the best information we have, is there will be a, a nuclear-free Middle East where they intend to dismantle the Israeli nuclear weapons deterrent in exchange for Iran not proceeding with its nuclear program. The United Nations will be in charge of this process. Another part of the puzzle is the United Nations is going to be given control of Jerusalem. Now, from our perspective, there is also a parallel course of nuclear disarmament. Now, Obama has already made clear, in fact, he was an anti-nuclear advocate going all the way back to his days at Columbia. Uh, he has already forced through the Senate one new nuclear arms treaty, cutting back on our own arsenal, and he plans on cutting our arsenal back in total by about a third, which in my view will make the United States more vulnerable to a nuclear attack from Russia and China, which has its own nuclear weapons arsenal, and who together, Russia and China, cooperate in an organization called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. 
Obama, at the same time, has made it clear, despite his promises to the Senate when he got them to ratify this new nuclear arms treaty, that he will not modernize our nuclear deterrent, what's called the triad of nuclear submarines, strategic bombers, and land-based missiles. The, this is all in the context and the backdrop of these extraordinary developments regarding the Roman Catholic Church. And you've got to admit that a photo on the front of the Washington Post showing the lightning hitting the Vatican after the Pope's resignation was announced is quite startling. Now, again, you interpret it the way you want to. I'm here to tell you, based on my journalism and research, and through a website we've developed over the last couple years called religiousleftexposed.com, that there are Christians, there are conservatives in the Catholic Church who are very worried and troubled by developments within the Roman Catholic Church. One, a priest, said to me, quote, why is Benedict laying down his cross and right at the beginning of Lent to boot? Let me remind you that uh, Benedict, when he became Pope back on April 25, 2005, asked all Catholics to pray for him. This is what he said, pray for me that I do not flee for fear of the wolves, unquote. Now, the Catholics, the insiders I talked to say he wasn't talking about wolves outside the church. He's talking about the wolves inside the church. Now he's fleeing. And frankly, the explanations of poor health don't suffice for an explanation. Benedict had resisted only so far and only so much. He himself had issued uh, an encyclical calling for the establishment of a world political authority. Those were his words. Uh, Cardinal Peter Turkson, president of the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, had himself proposed what he called a global financial authority. Turkson, by the way, uh, is rumored to be in the running as the next pope. He's, the, um, he's from Africa. They're saying he could be the first African pope. Benedict had even joined with uh, the American bishops, led by Cardinal Dolan, who had proposed sainthood uh, for Dorothy Day, who was a Marxist, who was a leading figure in what is called the Catholic Worker Movement. Now, as going back a little bit, as, as Cardinal Ratzinger, before he became Pope, Benedict had taken a stand against the New Age movement. This was very significant at the time. He had condemned and banned from preaching and teaching people like the, quote, father, Matthew Fox, author of the book, The Cosmic Christ, it is that cosmic Christ, not the true Christ, who dwells in the meditation room of the United Nations. Who is that handsome guy in there anyway? Uh, I came out of that place and people said that I glowed in the dark. I'm, no, I'm <laughs> But it is, it is a rather spooky place, and not Casper the Friendly Ghost spooky. I mean, this is a, a very sinister place, in my view. Uh, the focus of what they call the energies of a unified planet. And to show you, I mean, we go in these places. I'm not afraid to go into the meditation room or go into the UN or go into the place called Lucis Trust, which is a place we went into on Wall Street about a month ago in New York City. Anybody remember the original name of Lucis Trust? 
Lucifer Publishing. Lucifer Publishing, now on Wall Street, has various branches, and as you go through their lobby there, you, you go through a lobby uh, that has the United Nations flag. And I was able to go in, and they welcomed me, and let me really have the run of the place and go into their library where you could find uh, uh, books on um, uh, how to perform miracles. You find Matthew Fox's book, The Cosmic Christ, the uh, uh, legendary, in a negative way, books by Marilyn Ferguson on the Aquarian Conspiracy, which of course is credited or blamed for the rise of the New Age movement. And this is a group that works hand in glove with the United Nations and who also publish literature proclaiming the advent of the next Messiah. Sometimes they refer to him uh, as just, quote, the one. Uh, just a few blocks from the UN itself, there's a place uh, sponsored by the Theosophical Society called Quest Books. Uh, where UN officials uh, go on the occasion of a full moon to hold meditation sessions. Now let's talk about the American Catholic Church. One of the experts we've consulted is named Carol Byrne, who wrote a book on the uh, Catholic worker movement and who has analyzed this push for sainthood for Dorothy Day, who I point out was a longtime Marxist who supported communist regimes that actually engaged in the killing of Christians. And she says this. She's talking about the current situation with the Catholic Church. By having financed the Alinsky-inspired training of Barack Obama, via the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, the bishops have been nurturing a serpent in their bosom. Now in typical socialist fashion, he has turned his guns on the church with his plan to force Catholics to fund state-run policies that conflict with their consciences. That is only the beginning of an all-out assault whose objective is to extinguish any vestige of Christianity in society. These are the stakes. And consider the timing during the election campaign as Obama campaigns for re-election. And after he's already ordered or provided this edict to the church that the film For Greater Glory was released about how in Mexico the Catholic priests were actually murdered murdered in the churches for standing up for their faith. If you haven't seen that movie, please do so. And don't forget that Saul Alinsky himself, who wrote Rules for Radicals, who was one of Obama's teachers, had dedicated his own book to Lucifer. Alinsky had described Lucifer as the very, this is, this is a quote from the book, the very first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom. A Catholic priest tells me the following, and again, we have some of the best sources in the church. I think that the church is in for some very tough times. The bishops made a deal with the devil to get Obamacare passed. And now that the devil has turned on them, they have nowhere to hide. He predicts Obama's takeover of the U.S. Supreme Court and the bishops losing their religious freedom lawsuits against Obamacare. Eventually, the Catholic hospitals, the orphanages, the social service agencies, the schools and universities will either close forever, he says, or be bought out by secular entities. Consider the words of Catholic Cardinal Francis George, quote, I expect to die in bed. My successor will die in prison. And his successor will die a martyr in the public square. 
His successor will pick up the shards of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization as the church has done so often in human history. Again, these are the Catholics looking at the situation themselves. What this entails is development of what we're calling the new global legal order to supersede, really, U.S. democratic decision-making through our own Congress and our own elected bodies. In addition to the use of international courts and tribunals, uh, they are going to change our laws through international pressure, such as abolition of the death penalty, of capital punishment. That's one of their key objectives, too, in order to teach us a lesson that we have to conform with international standards. And, of course, Obama, in the push ahead, because he has uh, more Democratic liberals in the Senate, will be, in the next few months, pushing again for passage of various UN treaties, including the Law of the Sea Treaty, which has its own global taxes provision. A little bit about my organization, America Survival. Back in uh, 2008, before Obama's uh, election, his first term, we had released a uh, FBI file on somebody named Frank Marshall Davis. Frank Marshall Davis, it turned out, was the surrogate father, perhaps real father, who educated Obama, who guided his uh, upbringing in Hawaii for about 10 years of his life. Remember the uh, Kenyan Obama uh, wasn't around. He had left. And uh, it was Frank Marshall Davis who really became Obama's we call him the communist mentor because Frank Marshall Davis was not the subject of an FBI file for no reason. He was a member of the Communist Party under surveillance by the FBI for 19 years. In addition, Frank Marshall Davis, uh, the subject of, uh, of that excellent book by Paul Kangor, which came out last year in 2012, Davis was also, in addition to being a communist, as if that wasn't bad enough, he was a, a, a pornographer, he was a pedophile, and he uh, uh, was a doper. He smoked dope. Now, we tried our best through my group and accuracy and media to get out the truth about Frank Marshall Davis. Uh, we had held conferences. We had a film called The Unvetted. Uh, we did what we could, uh, but ran into a brick wall in so many ways, not just because of the liberal media. You expect them not to cover something like this, but even the conservative media. We tried to take out advertising highlighting some of these findings on the Drudge Report, supposedly a conservative Internet site, and our advertising, our attempt to buy dollars, to, to pay for ads rejected because the subject matter was, quote, too controversial. And of course, as if that wasn't bad enough, we saw what happened last year when the Republican presidential nominee, Mitt Romney, acting on the advice of Karl Rove, uh, decided that he could not label or expose Obama for what he is. And consequently, he wouldn't even raise the issue of him possibly pursuing a Marxist agenda, wouldn't dare call him a socialist. So when you don't emphasize or tell the truth, consequences are going to follow. And Romney went down to a humiliating and embarrassing defeat. But we believe it is imperative to start a, a new, restart this process of educating the people, especially young people, about the dangers of Marxism. Most people, I think, recognize that socialism doesn't work. But the problem is they don't understand that Marxism does work. It, it works in the sense of maintaining, of grabbing and maintaining political power. And that's what we've seen with Obama. He understands he is a Marxist. He understands what Marxism is all about in terms of grabbing and maintaining power. And he's continuing to do that even after his uh, re-election because you see it, he's still campaigning. He's still emphasizing the Marxist class warfare. This is, 
this is part of his ongoing campaign to eventually, I think, destroy uh, the Republican Party and take back the Congress of the United States, at least the House, from the Republicans in two years. Robert Chandler uh, wrote a report for us, America's Survival, back in 2009. And he outlined, and I think it's, it's, still, it's still a good summary, 10 easy steps to take, take a country. And let me list them for you. Change the popular consensus. Destroy Christianity. Destroy the traditional family and existing social mores. Transform the culture. Install radical left mind control. Attain political power, impose strict control of the military and law enforcement, restrict freedom in general, socialize the economy, erase American so sovereignty, and embrace a world without borders. So Obama is pursuing a strategy and has been able not only to get reelected, but to continue to put the Republicans on the defensive because he in the true spirit of a, a community organizer, has out-organized them. He has out-organized them. In the recent election, he actually upped the liberal majority in the U.S. Senate, again, enabling them in the future to pass more controversial U.N. treaties. Now, what's also emerged since I wrote my books on the U.N. over the last roughly 10 years is the rise of these international power brokers operating through what are called hedge funds. We call them the hedge fund short sellers, led by somebody like a George Soros, who really has done more to spark revolution than the communists ever did. Because they're able to make or break nations and their currencies. Soros and the hedge fund short sellers are what is responsible for uh, collapsing the U.S. economy in September of 2008 through the housing crisis, which continues to this day. That is really what enabled Obama to seize the presidency in 2008. So if we summarize what's happening to the United States, in trying to do so in a factual manner, we've got a communist educated president raised as a Muslim, supposedly leading the free world, but who is presiding over the destruction of the free world. At one of our conferences that dealt with what we call the Soros Files, and we have a website, SorosFiles.com, going into the detail about all of this. Businessman Zuby Diamond, who had come from Africa, made a successful uh, uh, business here and who wants to see our society uh, preserved. He said, Obama is Karl Marx and Louis Farrakhan rolled into one. <laughs> it's, it's pretty true. Soros, though, has been the money bags behind the transformation of America. By his own estimate, he's put in $8 billion, with a B, into the progressive movement here and abroad, including, including buying, paying for pseudo-Catholic groups that take his money. Now, these hedge funds are, are regulated to regulated lightning. They're, most of them are based offshore. They're not really subject to the jurisdiction of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and they launder drug money. Now, maybe some of you heard about this amazing case from last December, not too long ago, uh, called HSBC Bank, a British-based bank, uh, admitted, listen to this, admitted laundering $881 million for the Mexican and Colombian drug cartels, passing hundreds of millions of dollars to Iran and other sanctioned 
nations in violation of the Trading with the Enemy Act. They were caught. They were caught, and the Justice Department announced uh, that they had been caught doing this over the course of 10 years. But what happened? They were fined about $1 billion, which is really peanuts to a bank this big, and the Obama administration told them, point blank, we're not going to prosecute any of your top officers. Nobody prosecuted. Nobody sent to jail. So where are we heading with all this? What's going to happen next? Lee Penn, who wrote the great book, False Dawn, says, and we quote him in one of our reports, the question is not whether there will be a new world order. The question is, who will control it? Our economy is already being propped up by drug money and funny money from the Federal Reserve. The plug could be pulled at any time. We don't know when. The United States, it could be so bad, the United States could be forced to go to the IMF and the World Bank for bailouts, the kind we thought were reserved for the third world. We could be in that position. Or the collapse could be used uh, to push for the global tax that George Soros has always been in favor of, or a new form of international currency, uh, which, he, uh, which is already in existence, which is being used on a limited basis uh, out of the IMF. Now, we at America Survival have been, as I say, in the thick of this battle, holding conferences, issuing videos. We have 172 exclusive videos on our website, usasurvival.org. Please take some time. Please take some time to visit our literature table. Visit our website, usasurvival.org. Take advantage of this information. We're an educational group. We're trying to get this out at the lowest cost possible. Most of this is just free. We try to just put it into your hands. I want to mention, in the few minutes I have left, one of our latest concerns, which uh, I hope you can help us out with. And that is the advan advance of the Muslim Brotherhood onto American soil through this deal with Al Gore and Al Jazeera, where Al Jazeera, which of course is the voice of the Muslim Brotherhood, was the voice, the mouthpiece of Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, is has announced the purchase of Al Gore's current TV channel, giving them access to 40 to 50 million homes in the United States. Now, don't think that this is a First Amendment issue, because it's not. Terrorist organizations are not entitled to protection of the First Amendment. Al Jazeera is a terrorist organization. It employs terrorists. It acts on their behalf. It works hand in glove with the terrorists. And so we at America Survival are demanding, in a polite sort of way, that the House Homeland Security Committee headed by Texas Republican Michael McCall, open immediate hearings into this deal. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. This is the equivalent during World War II of bringing Tokyo Rose and Axis Sally into the United States and giving them access to American broadcast facilities so they could undermine the war effort. As it was, we remember, looking at the history books for those who are too young, Axis Sally and Tokyo Rose were the names given to the German and Japanese broadcasters, Americans, who were broadcasting against the war effort, trying to undermine our side, demoralize our troops. And after we won the war, our forces picked them up, brought them back to the United States, prosecuted them, and put them in prison for treason. So how can a deal like this go forward? Have we lost the, the ability to understand the, the, the nature of treason, of, of aiding the enemy? So ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude uh, this way. 
And I'm going to have to cut some of the slides short, but I'll be happy to talk to you later about this in more detail. We've got plenty of reports that go into all the detail about this. We've got, we've got a major global power struggle underway. Robert Chandler, who wrote a number of reports for us, put it this way. He wrote a great book called Shadow World. He said, the Russian communists, the leftist ideologies, and the Islamist extremists are locked in a geopolitical struggle for not only America, but the world. Look at, look at the adversaries we're facing today. A god of hate, which is what they worship in radical Islam, and which they are promoting through Al Jazeera. A mystical one, or Messiah, promised by those who see Lucifer as a positive force for good in the world, who's just giving us knowledge of good and evil. Or the godless state of international communism, which of course, as we've seen, a bloody record of 100 million killed? That's the record of international communism, which promises killing fields, slaughter, or if you're lucky, re-education camps. The Christian church is the only significant force that stands in the way of the victory of one or more of those forces. And whether you like the Roman Catholic Church or not, the Roman Catholic Church is the, in the, is the really or only form of organized opposition to the forces that are arrayed against us. America hangs in the balance. And we all wonder at this point, I wonder, is there another greatest generation that will rise up and save her from these forces of mysticism and tyranny? The answer is up to you. Thank you very much. This has been Soros, Obama, and the UN Plan to Rule the World, presented by Cliff Kincaid. To receive a free catalog of over 250 awesome Bible studies on DVD or CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, call Compass at 1-800-977-2177, 24 hours a day, or visit us on the web at compass.org.